Hey everyone, excited about this episode. I have Steve here. Um, this is gonna be an amazing and fun ex episode because I love SEO. And this man has been in the SEO industry for many years now. And so um, Steve, before we kind of open up and really kind of go into those questions that we've, we've discussed and really to help the audience understand uh, SEO and, and the impact and all the different strategies, um, I know you've been in, in the SEO world, I think since 1998 when Google launched, when Larry and Sergey like first started Google. Um, so I'd love to eventually learn how you got into SEO. Um, I know you run a consulting uh, SEO group as well. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then you work with some amazing brands. I think uh, I, IHOP, Applebee's and Disney uh, are some of the a few to mention. Um, but some, some core things I would love to get some background knowledge on too is I think you're in the military, um, also a, you're a professor. You do, a, <laughs> you're, you're doing like so many things at once. I'm trying to figure out how, how you keep up. Um, before we start, just yeah, give us some background information on how you got into SEO. Um, also some information on, some background information on your, your consulting group. And then just a little, uh, some insights on uh, being in the military and being a professor. Well, I guess it started with the military. I was in the, Army Infantry in Fort Hood, Texas. I had always had a affinity for computers, starting with the uh, the old Apple IIe and playing Oregon Trail, and we had real floppy disks back then, right? Um, <laughs> but when I was in the in uh, the infantry, I was in Fort Hood, Texas in '94, and I was part of an operation where we had to train infantry soldiers on how to use laptops so that they could remotely fire off. Um, uh, weapons from uh, the Bradley assault vehicle that I was uh, a driver for over hills. So we'd send a trooper up with a, a Kevlar with a camera on it. And then we'd be able to measure the distance of where the enemy is and fire a missile over a hill directly to where they were at. And um, it was kind of fun because, you know, I remember being in the, the, the back of the room at, at one point, you know, walking around and I could look and I felt like I was in a rock concert because everybody was, um, everybody was like nodding off you know, because infantry yeah. soldiers and laptops just, they just don't jive, right? right. So um, you get these guys sitting down for more than 30 seconds and they're out cold. So um, so it's kind of fun. I'm like, man, am I at a rock concert? Everybody's like nodding. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so my, my passion for, for, you know, digital and internet all started while I was, you know, in, in 94, 95, as um, we started to build these funny websites for fun. And I started to help a lot of uh, friends that had uh, small businesses and DJs and things like that. And um, they didn't have any money, you know? So, and when, when we did any sort of marketing for them, it had to be free. It had to be, you know, basically hacking our way to get them free traffic. And the best way to do that was, you know, through search engines at the time, you know, Excite and Alta Vista and, um, you know, Yahoo, and then eventually Google. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we, we kind of learned by necessity, I think those of us older SEOs uh, started in web design, built these, these slow loading table-based designs <laughs> that eventually evolved into these table-less designs using these great style sheets that allow us to have fewer lines of code, load our pages faster, and now be even more friendly with these beautiful little viewport tags that make them you know, optimized for a responsive um, experience. So um, that's that's kind of the early days of how I, I kind of got into it. Um, yeah. Went back to school and I got a degree in e-business management. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, computer networking, database, um, learned how to um, do some graphic design, some programming, and then, you know, from a project management standpoint, how to how to put all that together, how to, you know, pre-plan oh, wow. a, a site from conception to launch and then into the marketing component of it. And um, I did, did that as a, a night school thing while I was working full-time at IBM. So I was already kind of doing the grind from seven in the morning and, um, yeah. you know, stopping at, at my parents' place for a, for a free meal and, and a, you know, to get a break before I headed off to school. And then I'd get home at 10, 30, 11 at night. And my wife would be like, this isn't a marriage. You're like, you're never here. <laughs> And I'm just like, right. but I'm almost there. Just bear it, bearing with me, right? And those last terms were really tough on us because I was just never there. Yeah. Um, but then I got through it, and you know, we I uh, got some pretty incredible uh, job opportunities after that. I worked for Disney Parks and Resorts Online as the SEM account manager for Disneyland.com and Adventures by Disney. Um, wow. I took on some agency roles after that that paid more but had less perks and didn't have the same amazing culture Disney had. Yeah. Um, and then I decided in 2010 that I wanted to be closer to home. We had these two little babies at home that my wife needed some help with. And 
So I just started freelancing and selling SEO audits and strategies for 500 bucks. And right. um, starts, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I met, um, I met some people that changed how I look at business. Uh, Scott Sorrell, Mr. Charge Higher Prices, yeah. uh, a salesperson, mm -hmm. Mary, who I worked with. Um, they, they all said, you know, hey, the value that you're providing in these reports, what does it generate in revenue for say an e-commerce website? What does it generate in leads that, that result in sales for your customers? Right. And I'm like, sometimes millions of dollars and you're charging $500? So almost immediately, I went from five hundred dollars to thirty five hundred, and the same same corporate level audits and strategies that I developed, you know, during my time in corporate. Now we sell for as high as twenty thousand. So it's nice to see how in eleven years you go from sell, selling a five hundred dollar report to it being, you know, as as high as you know, in some cases as high as forty thousand dollars for a strategy, and it's it's exciting, but it, it was also a lot of work. It was a lot of chipping oh, away yeah. at proposals chipping away at the the collateral and and constantly improving our deliverables to meet you know today's current seo um, requirements and, and best practices prioritization effort level training yeah. documentation references you've you've got to evolve everything that you do to to provide the value of what you're charging not just the expertise so it's it's a lot of cheese work but at the same time it's also like you said you know 22 years of experience Wow, that's awesome. And to your point, you you hit the nail on the head. You're 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 getting paid for the value. And that's that's key because you're you're helping businesses grow and make millions of dollars. So you have to get paid for that, right? And so yeah, my students hate it though. My students like, why do I why do I need to have a logo? And why why does the <laughs> spacing on the logo have to be a certain distance from the top and from the side? And you know, why do the aesthetics matter? Why does the font matter? Why do I need to do all this stuff? And I'm like, because you're going to set yourself apart from the next guy. When you walk in with this level of presentation from, mm -hmm. from corporate level learning, they're going to know you're a pro and you're not a rookie and you're not going to have to learn how to, how to create really attractive looking content. And, right. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I think when they get through it and I get so many great emails from people from three years ago who were in my, my original classes that were like, you know, now I get it. And I'm making a ton of money and I'm, I'm so thankful for what you taught me beyond just the technical skills and being able to, to think about the little details and how you do things. And um, I think a lot of it was inspired, of course, by the corporate era, but some of it was um, having, having um, who was it at the time, Anderson Consulting. And they came in with at IBM once and they had this ridiculously awesome presentation they brought in, the spiral binder and beautiful laid out, you know, strategy and um, gorgeous table of contents look like something that cost them thousands of dollars to make. And oh, I thought wow. one day I want to be able to create content like that mm -hmm. so that my customers feel like, like this is really good corporate stuff, not just my little $500 audit, but something that's evolved into, um, you know, what it is today. Uh, that's awesome. And, and so you, you briefly mentioned students. Talk about uh, how you teach now. Um, and then also love to learn a little bit about your consulting group. Sure. I think one of these days, the, the folks that run the programs that I'm involved in um, are going to look at the programs and they're going to say, how are you getting away with this? <laughs> because I don't I don't I don't do deadlines, really. You know, I, I don't do required um, craziness. I don't play politics. Um, I don't uh, beat students up who, who can't attend in office hours or um, who aren't as, as engaged, right? If I feel like the student's really passionate about learning the material and they're sending emails and they're into it, they're going to get a great grade. And so for me, yeah. you know, my, my teaching methodology has always been around try to provide real life experience content. All the digital um, online classes that I'm teaching, there's, there's a reference to a textbook if they want to use it but I was able to get it to not be required. So none of my lectures are based off of bullet lists and lecture slides. Instead, they're the same presentations that I give to conferences and at speaking events on real wow. examples and case studies. They get to use the same templates and checklists that we use for our corporate clients. They get to see real data um, you know, for, for those that are that are older accounts where I'm not under an NDA anymore, I get to share some really interesting insights so that they can work in reverse when they start their new job and know what a report should look like, know what their deliverables should be, know what KPIs that they should be suggesting to their clients or their um, and their, their, their employer. So um, I'm trying to prepare the students for real life um careers in digital marketing as opposed to just memorization of terms 
yeah. um, you know, and, and techniques. So it's even the class name at, at Cal State Fullerton is strategic SEO, right? It's, it's around yeah. how do you how do you do research and build a comprehensive strategy so that you're not just doing SEO, you're not just doing Facebook, right? You're, you're uh, implementing a plan of action that's prioritized based on where you're going to see the most value in the shortest amount of time. Yeah, I think that's so important because you can learn, but if you're not applying what you're learning, you're you're just taking that information in one ear and it's going out the other. Oh yeah, um, yeah my, my, my class at UC San Diego is tools and analytics. And what we do there is we, we give every student a WordPress site. Then they oh, go out wow. and they get the code for Google Analytics. They get the code for Tag Manager. They install both. They verify both by going to their phones, make sure that it's tracking real time. They wow. set up conversion <laughs> tracking. They do everything on their own following this little guide that I set up that I have to change every term because Google keeps changing their, their yep. darn Google analytics. <laughs> but, um, but it's great because it's so hands-on and, and you don't really get that at universities and colleges. You get them at, at technical schools. So okay. that's why I said, I think one day a program director is going to come in and be like, Wiedemann, you can't do it this way. You've got to do it, you know, the old fashioned way. And so far, no one said anything. And, um, my feedback and surveys have been great. So I guess they're just like, as long as the students are getting what they, they need and no one's complaining, leave them alone. Right. <laughs> but one day awesome. I'm sure they're going to catch me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how, how, how long or how often are you, are you teaching? Um, I'm teaching nine classes, fortunately not concurrently at the moment. The Fullerton classes are um, uh, on pause until uh, spring. The San Diego class doesn't start until winter. Um, the six classes I'm teaching at Fullerton Community College, four are uh, active that started this week. I started on Monday. Two more start October 4th. Um, it's really only an hour of, of my time per class, uh, of which sometimes students don't even show up. So I can use that time to, you know, grade assignments or, or whatever. But I always give an hour to each class to be available for them for FaceTime. Uh, but beyond that, it's all done through Canvas. It's all done through um, you know, pronto and email and um, Canvas inbox. Uh, it's through discussion threads and Q and A threads. So it's it's really, for the most part, really self paced. And um, I just try to make myself available to to help them, you know, as as needed. But yeah, so so nine classes, not always concurrently, thankfully, because it's a lot to take on. I usually yeah. don't jump in until after hours, so I can focus my daytime on trying to you know, grow this business and meet amazing people like you and, and try to share some value. But, um, uh, but yeah, so the, the hardest thing for me among the nine classes and the, you know, the running the agency and being the SEO, you know, coordinator of what we're doing for Applebee's and IHOP is I was writing a book. It took me a year to uh, oh, wow. me and my, my co-author, Scott Cowley. Um, you know, I, I played the first author role and wrote the initial content and Scott made it amazing. And so, um, so we, we wrote what we think is the first college textbook specifically on SEO uh, adopted by by Stukent and now by several That's colleges awesome. that use Stukent. So so it's not just a book, it's also courseware and a simulator and um, lecture slides and teacher lecture slides and and um, prompts and lecture plans. And so it's 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 a lot more than what we anticipated. We thought, oh, we we'll just write a book, it's easy. But the courseware <laughs> part of it was a lot more work. So imagine doing that, right? Running an agency, um, you know, and and teaching nine classes. Um, and writing a textbook. That was a very difficult, very exhausting year, but the book's done, courseware is done. Yes. Uh, the teaching is, is ramped down now because of, of schedule shifts. Um, and you know, the agency's pretty much running on its own with just me supporting those two main accounts. So it's, it's, it's got a nice balance now, but I can tell you for a while, there was a lot of stress. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. And on top of that, you have a family. So <laughs> trying to manage all that is uh, well, the reason awesome. I'm doing all that is for the family. I mean, let's be honest, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. And so to your point, uh, like I, I want to be a student again <laughs> with all the things that you're doing. And, and, you know, I wish I had, you know, that type of uh, those type of courses uh, when I was back in college. Um, but well, you know, the one, the one I teach at Cal State Fullerton, um, we actually made a version of it for our little Academy of Search that we started. It's just okay. academyofsearch.com. If any of, if any of your listeners want to see, a, you know, a, basically one of those courses that I teach, just use, use my, uh, my handle SEO Steve as a promo code and you can get free access to it. Uh, feel oh, free to awesome. share that with your listeners, put the link in there. It's academyofsearch.com. Use code SEO Steve and you can take the same course, which by the way, includes all the same templates we use for Applebee's and IHOP and public storage and Skechers. All those same templates are available in that, that curriculum. So you'll learn everything from technical SEO to content writing, keyword research, 
off-page SEO and then web analytics, kind of tying it all together. So it's um, it was meant to be a six week course, but I've had two people come back and say they completed the whole thing over a weekend. So <laughs> oh, wow. have fun, you get a certificate, you know, buy an actual adjunct professor. So it counts for something, so enjoy. Yeah, that's awesome. And we'll make sure we include that information in the description of this episode. And I think now it's a good transition to really talk about uh, the meat of this conversation, which is local SEO. You have a, a wealth of experience doing SEO, especially for local businesses. Right. And so you created an infographic recently, and I just couldn't stop reading it. Just <laughs> all the different facets and details of local SEO. I can't SEO. take credit for that infographic. It was, it was really Brian Wallace and now sourcing that had the the, the brilliance of creating the infographic. We we did the research and the study and yeah. gave suggestions on what we'd like to see in it, especially the anatomy part of what a page would look like, but that's all now sourcing. Brian is just absolute genius. If you haven't used him at least once for one infographic or one graphic on your website, you'll the value you'll get, not just from the graphic itself, but for the follow-up work that his team does to help promote it, uh, it goes well beyond what you'll pay for, for that service. So please, if you like that graphic, Call the folks at Now Sourcing and use them. They're amazing. And are they are they attributed on the infographic on that landing page? They sure are. Absolutely. I'll make sure that's included in the description of this episode as well. I'm um, glad you liked it though. We put a lot of work into it. It was it was over about 120 days of, of effort between you know the the study of 300 different local pages and adding new columns every time we found a new attribute that we wanted to look at, um, and then kind of kind of aggregating that data to create some some insights that might be helpful for businesses and for SEOs. That was the whole thing I was trying to get at when I when I put this together was to help other digital marketers. So when their boss says, why should we do this? Help me quantify why I should why why I should spend twenty thousand dollars trying to create custom content on on all six hundred of our pages. right? Right. Why should I do that? Well, this study came back that shows that we'll have 107% competitive advantage if we have hyperlocal content. Boom. There's your, there's your um, oh. arsenal that you need to fight back with when you get the naysayers in the leadership team or the web development team, right? Yeah, it was <laughs> definitely uh, very data-driven. Um, and then each segment, which what we'll talk about is really uh, how to design landing pages, really looking at hyper-focused um, local content technical SEO and your off uh, your off page ranking factors. Right. So going into that, the, the data driven aspect. Mm-hmm. So when you did when you guys did all the research and spent that much time uh, really just analyzing uh, the data from a local SEO standpoint, as it relates to designing uh, local uh, location pages for SEO, right. what are some of the strategies that, that just, you know, just was very important to that process to ranking Google? Sure. I, I think I think the most obvious was that we don't care about desktop, right? We care about mobile. And we really, I mean, you have to care about both, but the majority of your your energy and your your testing and your designing and uh, development should all be centered around providing an incredible, simple, fast mobile experience. Yeah. If a user has to think about what to do, where to navigate, if they have to flick, you know, up and down to figure out what uh, action to take, um, yeah. You know, if they can't find the phone number or a way to call immediately, um, there's there's so many of those things that that users need to see right away. If I'm looking for a local business, I need to know right when I get to that page, are you a local business or are you in some other state somewhere? Uh, what are your hours? Are you open right now? Um, is there a quick uh, button I can push to call right away? Um, yeah. If I want to start my order right now, can I can I just do that right from my thumb? Uh, and get through the whole experience with my thumb or do I have to now pull over to the side of the road and because you know we all text and drive we're not supposed to but we do Um, and now I got to type on my little keyboard you know what I need oh and there's a number field but for some reason I have the letter keyboard up instead of telling you know that the browser to use a number keypad now I've got to really punch the numbers at the top and then I get to the payments and oh I got to enter all my payment information because it's not auto filling or it's not giving me the option to use an Amazon pay or an Apple pay or a a Google Pay or a shop if I'm on Shopify. Instead, now I've got to, um, you know, put in my credit card information manually or worse, I've got to use PayPal, which I hate. So it's it's really trying to get a user through that from for, for all local business SEO and, and digital marketing and conversion rate optimization yep. through an experience on their phone where they can thumb their way through the experience without ever having to type in a single thing or think about what they should do. Yeah, because you got to think about it too, a smartphone is so small. Yeah. Like they need to get to their their eyeballs need to get to where they need to 
go from a call to action standpoint to make their buying decision or at least get the information they're, they're looking for. Even to that point of, I think on that infographic, it talked about directions, right? Like being able to click on, you know, where is this practice or business located and then click on that and understanding the address and then how long is that distance uh, to, from where they are and their proximity to that, to that business. So I think the stats and maybe you can, uh, you know, the specific numbers, but I know in, in Google Maps, if someone searches a business in Google Maps, the percentages are like ridiculous of when they actually go visit that, that business they search for. Sure. Um, so, so for the restaurant chains that, that we manage, we look at, you're right, we do look at that data. And as it turns out, it's, it's equal. We have equal clicks on, on maps and organic. 30, roughly 28 to 30% of the traffic goes directly to those local pages. So if you're scaling your local search and you've got more than one location, it's likely that most of the traffic is going to go to that location page. Um, Well, 30% of it will go to that location page and the rest will go to all sorts of other pages, including your homepage, mostly direct type ins and so forth, or just brand searches where they go straight to your homepage. But, um, but that local page is going to play such a, a important role. And it's going to be the one that you, you use as your website address in the Google, my business settings for your Google map listing, hopefully with a little UTM code to track, uh, and segment your organic from maps versus uh, normal organic. Uh, you do that just by you know using a, a, the URL campaign builder, just Google URL campaign builder and put in the, the local store page, put in what you want to use to track as your campaign name and, and so forth. I would use organic um, you know as, as your channel. I would use um, you know Google as your source and yep. then um, you know the, the medium would be something like like maps. Right. So, so that's a way to actually a meeting would be organic and the channel would be maps. Uh, and in doing that, you can look at your Google analytics and you'll see that 50, 50, you'll see 50% of the traffic going to, um, you know, organic from organic results. And you'll see 50% of it going to maps. Same thing with the revenue. Um, it's, it's amazing how, how much of an impact it is. Cause Google knows when you're performing a certain type of query oh, yeah. that you're looking for a place. So I'm going to show my places first, you know, yeah. and then I'll show organic listing second. Uh, that's awesome. And so really thinking about the the design aspect, that's the front end where that's the visual uh, sense of the website and getting the user experience that you want for that customer to get to your, your business, right? But then let's talk about technical SEO. So on the back end, the code that no one really sees besides Google. <laughs> so talk about like some of the important uh, local technical SEO strategies. Of course. Yeah, there's there's three ways to look at, at your, your technical SEO as it relates to your local page, right? There's there's the content aspect of it. Am I, am I showing all the right content in the right places? Um, am I loading some really heavy content at the top that could be at the, the bottom or the middle so that the top part loads the fastest? And some of Google's core web vitals, you know, really indicate that they're trying to make the, the first thing that users see on their mobile device, the first things that load, um, you know, load the fastest and everything else below the fold or below where you'd have to scroll or, or flick um, can load after. So um, from a technical aspect, that's, that's important is really knowing, you know, where, um, what content should be where so that we load the fast things that users need the most first. Second part of that um, would be looking at, um, on the technical side, it would be looking at um, the structured markup and things that we can use to provide better search results. So, you know, there's 10 listings in the search results. Who are they going to click on and why should they click on you? Well, if my listing stands out because I have stars beneath them, because I put some structured markup um, on the page with some of the ratings and reviews that I've received, um, I might stand out more. If there's common questions that people have that my customer service department and intake team um, can tell me or share with me, I can use those questions to put some FAQ page markup so that I have two other lines of, of, um, uh, of information underneath my listing in the Google search results. If I've got an image or a video, I can mark those up with image object or video objects so that they appear as thumbnails next to my listing for mobile users. That the goal is to stand out and to... Um, you know, and, uh, and to provide more value than the other nine listings that appear on the first page in the organic results so that yeah. I get the clicks. And if I get the clicks and my, my first phase is actually accommodated the user in, in speed, usability, accessibility, privacy, that they're going to stay on my page, not go back to Google and choose a competing result. Right. And over time, Google will start to infer that I was a better result. More users are clicking on me and more users are staying on me. So I'm yeah. going to continue to grow my rankings. 
That's awesome. One cool thing I, we've kind of uh, analyzed from a technical SEO standpoint is uh, schema markup uh, as it relates to aggregated reviews. So one thing that we used to do would be we would just add the schema markup, right? It would have aggregated reviews, the number rating, and then how many total reviews. Sure. And obviously you had to add those to the internal pages. So let's say a client had three locations. We would, we would be able to add those reviews to each or aggregate reviews to each location page based on how many reviews they had online, right? But Google got smarter and they stopped showing the actual star rating for when someone searched that, that let's say for a dentist, for example, dentist in Charlotte. When they searched dentist in Charlotte and that location page came up, it wouldn't show the, the, the five stars with the aggregated rating anymore. Yeah. But we did some competitor research and noticed that some of our competitors were still showing the star rating. And we're like, why is that? So first party yeah. reviews. Yep. And so what they did was they took, they created like these widgets on the website yep. where it, it just said reviews, right? When you clicked on that button, like if it was a widget and you clicked on the button, it would open up all their Google reviews. So they pretty much like implanted all the Google reviews, copied and pasted them into that widget when it opened up and added the schema markup, but not as the aggregated review, but as a product. And when they added that with the review rating, it started showing the, uh, the That's actual interesting. Star. I don't, I don't know how long that <clears throat> technique would last. I know we, we, we spoke with the Google My Business team at a, a local search conference in Santa Monica a while ago, and we asked, can we use Google reviews and pictures and so forth on our website? And they said, yeah, we want you to go yeah. for it. Absolutely. Um, it's not easy to extract some of those images though from the, the my business images, but um, they want you to use that content because you know they they want to provide better results. But um, but they've also made it clear that they don't want you using schema markup for ratings with third party reviews. Yeah. So you know if it, if it's working and they've got a hack going at some point, some competitor is going to see it. They're going to report it on the GMB oh, team. Yeah. Say yeah, you can't do this. So we're we're starting a test right now on um, one of our chains where. Um, we're going to put a little button up on 10 pages that says kind of the same thing. Leave, uh, how was your experience, right? And right. then we, we're kind of prompting them to say things that include the search terms we want um, you. So we're, we're prompting them to say, what did you eat? And did you order takeout or delivery? You know, be real specific about um, why you came in, how you, you ordered, and, and what food you had and what you thought of it. Um, right. So that way we're, we're including some search terms on the page that are generated from the users, not from, you know, hand typed content. So we're, we're hoping wow. to get at least 10 to test with. And, um, you know, we need at least five, I think at least five reviews to even qualify for a, a rating markup. But um, our goal is to, to intake that uh, information through Google Forms to start with. Um, okay. And then manually put them on the page as native reviews, as first party reviews that aren't from Google My Business or Yelp or Facebook or somewhere else. They're they're native to the person who went to that uh, specific location. Yeah. Um, and it's it's basically user generated content. And if we can prove that, we can prove that use case and in our data showed 4% of an advantage if we do have those native reviews, 4% is 4%, right? Oh, yeah. um, then then we can build a business case to, to roll out the technology to do it automatically. There's a cost to that, which for the business is probably gonna be somewhere like $20,000. Yeah. Uh, but when we look at that 4% increase um, and you're looking at potentially up to $2 million a weekend in, in revenue, um, 4% is a pretty nice number. So. Okay. Um, so our hope is, you know, with, with that native review feature and the data that we have to support doing the test to make that test the business case that, you know, culminates into, you know, um, a, a full rollout and uh, eventually more revenue. That's awesome. And so when you figure that out, will you update that infographic with that data research or will that be somewhere Absolutely. else? Absolutely. 100%. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, we're, we love and live transparency. So we're, that's, it's been, it's been the hallmark of our, of our group. You know, we don't white label anything. We don't. Uh, keep the tools we use secret. We give our clients uh, the same access we have to the Google Drive folders that we all work off of. They have access to the same project management systems we use. Uh, they're all in Slack, having the same communications on the same thread. So we we really we really embrace transparency and and communication more than I think than a lot of agencies do with their secret sauce and how they do SEO. We're the opposite. We're like, here's everything, and yep. we're going to help you through it. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's so smart because clients will, they'll have like the backdoor access to what's happening. 
Yep. And so the question, they won't, because you, you know, like, like most agencies, right? If they have a client, either the client is going to be, you know, they're going to love the results. You hardly ever hear from them. Or they're the client that, you know, emails you every two days and they have questions, right? I think in your scenario, I'm sure you have less questions because they're so... Uh, We're pushing hard. Yeah, that's, that's the opposite. We're the ones that are, hey, we need an update. Hey, did you get this schema thing fixed? Hey, did you get the ROI? <laughs> hey, the canonical tags are wrong. We're, we're the ones pushing our clients to do a lot of it. Our hope is to work with the client for a year and then yeah. have them on their own. Uh, but the reality is a lot of our clients have churn rates on internal teams, especially in big corporations. So we, we tend to stay on, um, you know, to make sure that uh, all the new team members have what they need to, to be successful. But um, yeah, our goal is to try to get a client to work with us for a, a year, get them dialed in. And then for years to come, we constantly get referrals or um, some of the, the great people we get to work with, the digital marketing managers move yep. from, you know, from your IHOP to your Blaze Pizza and suddenly get a phone call from Blaze Pizza saying, you know, <laughs> hey, we um, we heard about what you did, you know, with uh, with that other brand. Can we work with you, too? And so it's 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 great to build a rapport like that. And if a client wants to do it themselves, that's great. At some point, they're going to do it themselves anyway, whether you're yeah. sharing how you do it or not. So if right. they're motivated and they want to do it, that's fantastic. You know how many how many referrals you're going to get from a client that you empower to be able to do it on their own and save oh, yeah. the margin that they're wasting on these agencies that aren't you know providing the same value that you could get in house for a fraction of the cost. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And so what, one thing I really liked about uh, the kind of story you and you embraced and kind of gave through your transparency with that infographic, yeah. not only you know just the te- from the technical aspect or designing the website, but the hyper local content. Mm -hmm. I think this is the missing piece uh, for a lot of uh, SEO um, strategies that agencies are employing onto uh, their clients' websites. And so like like just breaking that infographic down of all the different segments, I think you sent some really good resources, obviously Apple um, or or not Apple, but uh, IHOP. And then I think it was a personal injury attorney. I believe that was one of the uh, clients that you sent over. And um, just really digesting all like the reviews, the surrounding area content, but just go go into some, I guess, some more detail on how to really create um, hyper-focused local content. Sure. Well, you know, Google keeps using the the term delightful, right? Create delightful content, content that's that's really helpful to what users really need. And and the, the easiest way to do that is to just to read your own reviews, listen to complaints um, and questions the customer service department deal with. Look at what people say in reviews about your competitors. What do they hate? What do they love? Right. And how can we take all of those things and and create the best, most helpful page? And that's that's where that hyper local content becomes more for the user than for the search engine. But the yeah. search engine is going to pick up on all of those unique characteristics of that page and they're going right. to compare it to the competing page maybe your olive garden right and olive garden has some texts a map um directions right and maybe some links to some social profiles well gee we have all those things too how can we compete and make a better page well let's let's do some stuff let's add a coupon to the page so that people who get here can can do something and and in fact let's barcode it so that uh that we can get attribution to know that that person actually made a purchase and quantify, uh, yep. you know, a visit from a keyword to a sale since we're, you know, QR coding it. Um, let's um, let's also add a video. Nobody has a video on their local pages. Let's create a little video of the location and um, uh, maybe a 360 virtual tour they can take to see the restaurant before they get there. Yep. Um, let's let's put some local images up that that show them that our restaurant's clean, that we're practicing safety during the pandemic that's still going on. Let's let's show them images of things that they're looking for and and not things that they're trying to avoid, right? <laughs> right. Um, so that so that we can create an experience that's that's really, uh, centered around that specific location and I know it's challenging you're like I've got I've got 2,000 locations and three guys on my SEO team how am I going to pull this off right? right patience and perseverance you know yeah. and creativity you start by creating some data fields maybe outsourcing the mining of that data data fields like what's the the nearest sporting venue what's the the, the nearest park or historical landmark what's the nearest college how far are you from each of those places yeah. Uh, what are some directions from those places you can take? What's famous about that area? Who's famous that's been at that location? Yep. You know, you, you go through that data mining process, 
put those fields into the uh, the system or platform that you're using to generate your local pages, create that dynamic content and pull those fields in so that each page is unique as possible as a phase one, right? Now you've got a template, you've got dynamic content pulling from 20 or 30 custom fields to make that page unique, including images and video. And as you're continuing to build each page to be as unique as possible manually, you've got a default that's still so much more unique than any of what your competitors have even thought about. Oh yeah, that, that, that sounds very complex. <laughs> but I, what, what I would ask to that is, as it relates to mobile, right? So we, we talked about mobile, and then you want to create an experience more, preferably on desktop, where you have all that information and content. How, how do you, how, how, like, I guess for the clients you work with, how are you strategic to make sure that you have content, but not too much on mobile, but yeah. you're still adding all that value with all the data points and the data mine, mining into the, the landing page uh, from kind of a hyper-local SEO standpoint? Absolutely. I've, I've got a few examples too. You already mentioned Applebee's and IHOP. So you can look at their local pages on mobile and, and you'll see a few things. You'll see some custom content that we created below the fold. Um, you know, that, that does address some of the keywords that we'd like to appear for. You can also see at the top of the page, some internal links. Um, we've got three now uh, on, on most of them. We've got a careers or jobs link. We've got a um, delivery page. We've got a, a takeout page. So we've created supportive content. Instead of just loading it up and creating this super long, crazy local page, we've created sub pages. The other example when we started doing this was actually in 2014 with Meineke Car Care Centers. So okay. if you take a look, if you use a Google site operator, right, site colon, right, and then drop in the URL to one of the Meineke locations, look in the search results at all the sub pages we created. We okay. created one for every service at each of those locations from um, oil change to uh, battery replacement to muffler and, and so forth. So we've, we've created service pages that are specific to each location using dynamic content, of course, because scaling that across 900 locations is crazy, uh, but, but doing it using dynamic works. So I think, I think that's two ways to manage it. One, you can use some accordions on a mobile experience where they can expand content. It'll still get crawled and indexed and still be helpful. Yeah. Um, or if there's enough content opportunity and there's enough search volume, create sub pages and then deep link to them from your local page. Gotcha, gotcha. And that's, that's pretty smart. So with, okay, with that scenario, essentially you had all change in Charlotte, all change in Ballantyne. So you created all these location pages for the services that they provided to really, you know, I think the ultimate goal right there is to rank. You, you've got to send that survey out to the location, send us pictures, send us images, um, if you need to expense it and get a photographer to get better quality, do it. If, if we can afford it, do the best you can and we'll work with it. You know, we'll get some Photoshop, um, you know, video, you know, anything that you can do that's going to make your page more unique than another location and more specifically more unique than a competitor's location, right. then you're setting yourself up for success. Uh, that's awesome. And so one, one last thing I'll, we, can, we can leave the audience with is, probably the most uh, non-sexy strategy with SEO, right? It is off-page, <laughs> off-page marketing, off-page SEO. Off-page is are... fun though, Lamar. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. It takes creativity. It, yeah, it, it, it challenges you to be better because it's the hardest, most complicated hardest, yeah. thing to do. Yeah. So what are, you, what are your go-to strategies for, for off-page? I got, I got one that'll solve for two things you mentioned. One, you mentioned schema. One yeah. of the schemas that you can use is event markup. So what we do on, on certain occasions, like say IHOP has a, a event coming up, their you know, National Pancake Day or something, right? right? We put some schema on that page for the event. Um, we put a deep link to the actual event page. Um, and then we put information about that event you know, into that markup. Below our listing, you'll actually see a date, a link to the event, and a description right in the search results to give us another row and another site link that users can click on in the search results to stand out. Yeah. Um, so it, it does two things there, right? One, it makes us stand out in search results um, yeah. and get clicked on more, but it also it is that the catalyst to new links, because now we can go to each of those communities if we've got a community outreach person and say, hey, we're doing a special event where there's free pancakes that help charity, right? Yeah. And we'd love to have you share it on the, you know, the Anaheim.org city website or AnaheimCity.net or um, you know, the Anaheim City Chamber, would you, would you mention the name, address, phone number, and 
a, a link to the page where we're, you know, we're having the event in two, three months from now, you can get some really strong links and some strong business citations to boost your map rankings by doing local events. We even attorneys can do events. They had uh, one attorney did a CPR class. He did a, a helmet giveaway for, for kids, you know, uh, where you give away helmets for kids uh, for safety. He did a, a blood drive, right? You get really creative and then you go to your neighboring businesses and, and the way you get them to want to link to you is you first ask them for money. Hey, will you contribute money to this? And they're all gonna say no, right? No one wants to put money into anything. And then you say, no problem. Can you donate time? No, we're all busy. It's, it's a lot of work and we got enough going on. We're busy. No problem. Hey, could I talk to your webmaster maybe? And they can share the event for us. Now they feel bad because they said no to you twice. They're not going to say no to you a third time. Right. And that third time you'll, you'll get 85% of the people after you've asked the first two questions about money and time. So there's, there's your, there's your approach to getting hyper local links by promoting some seasonal event that you do uh, that also benefits your click through rates and, um, hopefully your traffic. So, okay. So now that's amazing. And, uh, I have my moments. A, really, <laughs> a, really, <laughs> a really detailed strategy, but this is what we face sometimes, right? Where it's not an Applebee's or IHOP, right? They don't, yeah. they don't do events. They, they're not in the community. Are there any, and trying to convince them. Why can't you do events? You're a small coffee shop and you, you just opened up. You, so you tell the sheriff's department, Hey, I'd like to do a coffee with Sheriff Johnson you know, yeah. at our coffee shop and bring some of the neighboring community in to talk about ways that we can practice safety. Um, right. The sheriff's department says, yeah, that's awesome. Hey, you know, uh, whatever.gov forward slash sheriff's department just gave you a link because they're going to be at your location doing a free coffee thing for safety. Anyone can do an event. Okay. You just have oh, to yeah. get really creative on how you do it. Yeah, no, no, I agree. No, no, trust me. Like, you, you <laughs> can, there's a lot you can do, but then there's some, there's always pushback with some, uh, some clients, right? Not all clients. But I guess, what other strategies would you recommend outside of event link building um, sure. from an standpoint? Yeah, for, for local, right, the, the event thing is, is usually the, the easiest. Careers has been really helpful for us, you know, and, and doing those jobs pages, it, it gives us the ability to go to local community sites and um, county sites and get them to mention the, the job listings that we currently have available and deep link to the jobs sub page underneath that local page. We okay. do that with Meineke as well. You'll see jobs and employment opportunities underneath the local page, not in a separate career section. Did the same thing for Applebee's and IHOP, and it, it seems to be working pretty darn well right now. Um, yeah. you know, we're, we're getting some really, um, really authoritative traffic driving links um, from those. So, so I think the jobs, careers, and events are probably the biggest. If you want to go out beyond local, you know, link strategies in general, the, the easiest is, is going to your Google Analytics and go to your content section and look for any content with a title of uh, page not found, yeah. <laughs> right? And redirect all of those because those are likely coming in from other websites and you can probably recover hundreds. We, we found one the other day for a, a national um, uh, healthcare uh, type company that had 190,000 links coming into 404 pages. And just by doing a, a number of, of small redirects, we we're able to recover almost 200,000 links. Um, right. Applebee's had had 5,000 links pointing to 15 different 404 pages for Veterans Day. So we said, hey, let's redirect those 15 pages to a permanent URL. And within a day, we recovered 5,000 links. Other, other ways to get links are looking at um, your Google alerts for your brand name. When someone mentions you, if they're yeah. not linking to you, reach out and say, hey, could you make it so that when somebody sees our name, they can click on it and visit our website? and learn more about us. That way you're not asking for a link. You're just saying, hey, make that, that word clickable. Um, right. Other ways you could use intersecting link opportunities, tools like um, Ahrefs and, yep. uh, and ZMrush. You can, you can run an aggregate of all the competitors where they've earned links and wow. then do a pivot table and see which ones are the most common so that you're putting yourself at the center of that semantic web. Be, it's easier to get where your competitors are when there's more than one competitor getting a link um, as opposed to when you get down to the, the single competitors where they're doing shady things like creating all these separate websites that don't get any traffic that aren't really going to help you. Right. So I, I think there's some methods, the unlinked mentions, the link reclamation of broken links, the, um, you know, the, the intersecting link opportunities. The, the one thing I would, I would try to do regardless of SEO or anything is just create something on your website yeah. that, that is, is super relatable for your, your industry or for your customers. Yeah. That's either fun, funny, um, engaging, 
um, and something could go viral. I, I've got a few ideas of, of these link, link bait things that have worked really well for companies. Uh, for Progressive, they have a program every October, it gets a lot of traffic, Dress Like Flow. And there's this whole page just to associate <laughs> yeah. for Dress Like Flow, where you can get all the materials to wear a, a costume like Flow from Progressive. Um, you remember the Elf Yourself campaign? That was Office Max that did that. You know, where you can upload oh, yeah. your pictures of your friends and make them dance around as little cartoons from Jib Jab. Oh. Um, that was Office Max that did that. That was a link bait initiative to drive links and and you know viral traffic to build brand awareness that supported their SEO. So yeah. you know all, all of those kind of creative ideas. What can I do? What can I create that that nobody's done before that right. everyone will will find interesting? This this study that we did. You know, there's lots of local SEO strategies and techniques and guides. Uh, there's lots of anatomy of a local landing page infographics. So we wanted to do something completely unique. And, and we thought the the arsenal side of things of helping, you know, uh, provide a business case uh, to those that are, you know, that are faced with naysayer stakeholders, you know, right. so that we create something completely unique. And already, if you do the backlink profile on it, I think, I think we've earned well over 100 links just in the last two months since we launched it. Um, without having to pick up the phone and call anybody. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, think about. I remember you sent me the article, and you know, I knew it was going to do well just because of the the data behind everything that you produce. But then to show the results and also the details of how to go do it, I think that's critical. Like we're now taking some of that information and applying it in our agency to affect our clients ranking. So uh, it is a making checklist from it. Absolutely. Yep, and the checklist yep. is at the end too. You can actually see it in the table. So here are the things that we know from the data have an impact. And yep. then here are the things that we don't really have enough data to know, but you might yep. want to test. Yeah. So. And, and Steve, one last question for if, if as we, as we close, if, if there's a, someone who is getting started in SEO um, or, you know, a potential agency or, or client, where, where do you tell them to start, like as it relates to SEO? If, if there's just one bit of advice, I guess more simplistic in a sense, what, what do you tell them to start? I like I like our masterclass. I put this free masterclass together that that really gives a high level of kind of what to expect and what what white hat, black hat differences, best practices, principle based search, the the disciplines involved. You you really immerse yourself in. And what SEO is, you just demystify it, right? I like the masterclass, but um, if I were to do anything else, I, I have a, a Feedly account, F-E-E-D-L-Y. And there's a there's an export that I can share with anyone who wants to see the exact same thing that I see. But what I do is I, I follow all the major um, news sites in SEO. I, I subscribe to the Google Webmaster Central blog and the, the Bing Webmasters blog. And I put all of that into this Feedly account. So my daily newspaper is, is really this, this beautiful layout of all the things that are happening right now and the content that's coming from sites that, um, that I wanna pay attention to. And so that aggregate review of, of all the things that are happening from my favorite websites and getting that insight every day, for somebody who's new looking at that content, um, there's always links and the whole, the rabbit hole just gets deeper and deeper. You can explore it however long you want to and go as deep as you want to, or you can just start familiarizing yourself with the terms and the things that are happening. But that way you're, you're focused on now and not reading an old ebook from SEO Steve from 2005, right? So, um, so I would, I would, yeah, I would, if you want a copy of that file to import into your own Feedly account, just grab me on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to share that with you. Yes. So how, how can the audience reach you? Um, I, I know you're a busy man. You got a million things going on. I'm never but... too busy to help people. And that's that's, yeah, awesome. that's something I've, I, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the the small businesses that give me the opportunity to volunteer my time to, to break their websites. So, um, <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. And wherever I or someone on the team can provide free value, we, you know, we, we can't take a lot of accounts right now, but we can help um, as much as we can with free calls and support and guides and templates and checklists and cheat sheets. So please reach out if there's something that we can do to support you. You have free access to the training for sure, but our handle on all the social channels, if you want me directly, it's SEO Steve. If you want to talk to anyone on the team, there's nine of us here. Um, it's just Wiedemann, W-I-I-D-E-M-A-N. It's the same on all the channels. Awesome. Well, Steve, we appreciate this uh, in insight and information. Uh, I mean, you have the name SEO Steve for a reason. <laughs> You've been doing this for so long. Welcome. I still knowledge. get called that sometimes. Uh, I go into agencies and like SEO Steve is here, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> That's so funny. But yeah, man, I appreciate it. Um, we'll definitely uh, 
we're just so so uh, thankful for this opportunity and um yeah we'll see you guys next time thanks for letting me hang out with you i appreciate it thanks everybody absolutely